The next presidency that we need to discuss is that of Barack Obama. And Barack Obama was elected in 2008 amidst the financial crisis in the United States, the worst financial situation since the Great Depression. And in this election, he was campaigning on hope and change. Those were the two words that just kept coming up in Obama campaign literature and on the campaign trail and speeches. So hope and change is the theme of his campaign. And some of those changes were to come in the financial industry, in the investment industry. Something that was actually signed into law under President Bush in 2008 is the Troubled Asset Relief Program, better known as TARP. And this bailed out the financial industry. So a lot of banks and insurance companies that had failed as a result of the financial crash were being bailed out by the government. That was seen as saving the financial industry. Once President Obama took office, he took it one step further and signed into law the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act shortly after taking office in 2009. That, for short, is known as ARA. And this was supposed to stimulate the economy and get it growing again. So the financial industry had already been saved, and a lot of those things done under TARP were continued by President Obama, but he decided to take the next step as well and try to stimulate the economy through additional government spending. Classic Keynesian economic theory in a time of economic crisis. Some people were critical that he actually didn't go far enough, that not enough of a stimulus was put into the economy to get it back on its feet again. And that led both Presidents Trump and Biden, and we will come back to this in our next lecture, reacted to the coronavirus pandemic and the supply chain disruptions that resulted, the lockdowns that led to people losing hours on the job and therefore pay, that they were actually over-aggressive. So they looked back to Ara and said, wow, he, he wasn't aggressive enough back then and decided to be over-aggressive. And here we are in 2022 dealing with record-breaking inflation as a result of what Presidents Trump and Biden both did. And so it's a very fine line to have that Keynesian economic theory of government helping prop up demand and create a stimulus to get the economy going again. But if you overdo it, it can lead to things like inflation. Probably one of the most memorable moments of the Obama presidency, what stands out, what will always be seen as what he is known for, also one of the most controversial things of his presidency, is the Affordable Care Act. It's also known as, and renamed as a nickname, Obamacare. And in this program, people in the United States were required, this is called the individual mandate, required to have health insurance. If you got it through your employer, great. If you didn't have it, you had to go buy it in the private marketplace. If you couldn't afford a private marketplace health care plan, then you could receive subsidies from the federal government to help pay for your health care plan. So the individual mandate is probably the most controversial piece to this because it led to a drastic increase in government spending on health care that was already rather expensive from the Medicare Medicaid programs signed by President Johnson in the 1960s that were supposed to care for the elderly and the impoverished. So the Affordable Care Act, very, very controversial piece of legislation, but of all the things that happened during President Obama's presidency, probably also one of the things that he will be most remembered for, for good or bad. Another famous moment in his presidency was the killing of Osama bin Laden. 
and this famous image you can see below of the Situation Room on the day of the Bin Laden raid. So the intelligence agencies had gathered information saying that Osama Bin Laden was in a compound, you can see it here, in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Now this is a sticky situation because the intelligence was not guaranteed. They said by the time they got done analyzing all the data and all of the surveillance, that it was a 50-50 chance that the most wanted man on the face of the earth was living in that compound. About a 50-50 chance. So President Obama is presented with all of this information, and they have a timeline and all the contingency plans for a few different options. Number one, to simply bomb the crap out of the compound. Just hit it with intense amount of bombs. There was little chance they could confirm, however, that Osama bin Laden had been killed because there would be no U.S. personnel on the ground to confirm that. A second option, raid the compound with elite forces like the Navy SEALs and confirm the killing of bin Laden. And the third wild card here is do we inform the Pakistani government, who in the war on terror is technically our ally? So... President Obama has to make this decision. And by all accounts, if you are to watch documentaries about this, that he didn't sleep much the night that he told his advisors, I will let you know in the morning whether the mission is a go. And he didn't sleep much. He paced the West Wing. And in the morning, after much thought, people are saying, so what are we doing, Mr. President? And... He confirmed, it's a go. Let's go get him with the SEALs. The SEAL mission is a go. That's a very gutsy move on his part. Especially considering, if you remember back to the Iran hostage crisis that tarnished the reputation of Jimmy Carter, there was an attempted rescue mission by the Carter administration that went horribly bad. And there were images of burning wreckage of helicopters that had gone down prior to trying this rescue mission that all but ended the Carter presidency, that and the economic circumstances of the time. Well, here he is taking office in a time of economic turmoil. Now he also has a very, very almost identical circumstance of sending helicopters, not only to try to complete a risky mission, but to do so by flying American aircraft into the airspace of an ally and that's the added wild card here, is that do we inform the Pakistanis? Do we tell them? President Obama decided, no, we will keep it secret so that nobody could possibly leak the information and bin Laden escapes to go somewhere else. So the raid took place. You can see this famous image here. And probably the most famous part of this image is the look on Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's face. This is the moment right here that one of the two helicopters carrying the Navy SEALs into the compound crashed. And you can imagine the feelings of angst, especially in President Obama, having ordered this mission and a helicopter just went down. That's what ended Jimmy Carter's presidency, or one of the things that ended his presidency. So I'm sure he's extremely nervous. Did I make the right decision? Are those soldiers on that aircraft okay? So, very stressful moment. You can see the look of shock on Secretary of State Clinton's face. The raid was a success, however, and Osama bin Laden was killed by U.S. Navy SEALs. Another controversial thing that you see here in some graphics and a photograph of a renewable energy company's corporate building, the term crony capitalism. What does that mean? Well, it, it refers to the idea of government officials and people in business having a corrupt relationship in order to make money. And most people, when they picture a crony capitalism situation, they picture an oil tycoon bribing people so that they could drill oil in a certain place. However, the healthcare industry accounts for nearly six times as much money spent lobbying Congress than the oil and gas industry. 
And in the presidency of someone who just did a major overhaul to healthcare, it is something that opens you up to a lot of criticism. So you could see here how much the oil and gas industry spent on lobbying Congress. $126 million in the fiscal year 2017. You can also see that up here, more than twice that is spent lobbying on behalf of pharmaceutical and health product companies. Then you have hospitals and nursing homes spending almost as much as oil and gas, hundred, almost $101 million. Health professionals and their professional organizations spending $91.5 million. And then health services, HMOs, spending almost $82 million. You add all that up, and it's actually nearly six times what oil tycoons, which is what most people picture, spending on lobbying Congress. And there's a lot of accusations that some of the goals of Obamacare were actually enriching people that worked in the medical industries. Then you also had a controversy surrounding a renewable energy company that was supposed to be producing state-of-the-art solar panel technology, and that company was called Solyndra. And a whole bunch of that Aura money went into this Solyndra company that was bankrupt within the next couple of years after receiving all that government money. So crony capitalism is something you heard popping up in the media a lot during the Obama presidency. Another scandal, this one was viewed about as unfavorably as the Halliburton scandal was for President Bush, and this was a program run through the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and orchestrated by the Justice Department that would sell guns to criminals, knowing that they were criminals, knowing that they were putting those guns in the hands of criminals, in order to have sting operations in which they would catch them doing bad things with these weapons and arrest them. One of the guns that was sold in this program known as Operation Fast and Furious killed a Border Patrol agent named Brian Terry, which led to a lot of controversy in the media and this political cartoon in which Attorney General at the time, heading up the Justice Department, Eric Holder, is depicted in an ATF jacket saying freeze and pointing a gun, but he's pointing it back at himself, and the political cartoon is supposed to mean you had this idiotic program, and it's going to come back to bite you in the butt. And this was an extremely controversial news story, but a lot of it was masked from the public because President Obama declared executive privilege over all of his communications with Attorney General Holder that would have exposed whether any of this was corrupt or not. And so no one really knows for sure whether there was corruption involved or not because of the claims of executive privilege that hid a lot of that information. And without that information, it leads to a lot of conspiracy theories, much like the JFK assassination. When there's little information and a lot of it is classified or unknown, it leads to a lot of spinning of ideas in people's heads of what might be true. When President Obama ran for re-election in 2012, there are a few big stories going on at the time of this presidential campaign. A couple of them are IRS targeting scandals and an AP monitoring scandal. The AP, the Associated Press, is an organization that puts out news stories that are often then just, for lack of better comparisons, like copy and pasted onto local news sites. So you'll see something pop up on Syracuse.com that the Post Standard has passed on, and at the beginning of the story it says, like, via the AP. And so apparently AP journalists were being monitored by the government, and there was some belief that the monitoring of these people was for politically motivated purposes. The IRS targeting scandal was political action groups have to apply to the IRS for a certain financial status in order to 
raise funds for a political candidate and then spend them in support of that political candidate. And the IRS under President Obama was denying left and right all of these applications for political action groups that happened to be conservative and then approving many others that happened to be more liberal and that was seen as extremely politically motivated as well. So you can see some statistics here that popped up on the news that 68% of Americans thought that the targeting of conservative groups by the IRS was politically motivated. That's more than two-thirds of people. Another 62% believed that President Obama himself carried a certain amount of personal responsibility for that because the IRS was under his watch where this was happening. And 55%, so still a majority, not quite as large as the others, say that the IRS situation raises doubts about his administration's integrity. Those are pretty damning accusations, especially in a campaign year. Luckily for President Obama, his opponent, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, made an idiotic remark at a fundraiser about how 47% of people receive some kind of government benefit, and naturally, they're going to vote for the person who is going to keep their government benefits coming to them, and they won't vote for me because I don't advocate large amounts of spending on government benefits. Two problems with this. When you're campaigning for president, you do not want to alienate anybody. And to refer to a certain portion of the population as moochers off the system is going to alienate a lot of people. And especially when you can be depicted in the media as a heartless businessman who just enriched himself, such as the Carnegie-esque character from the famous game Monopoly. And the second problem with this is not only are you alienating people who may truly fall into that category, the 47% statistic was misleading as well because that included things like Social Security benefits. People pay into the Social Security system to then receive it back in their retirement years. So to use that 47% of people receive a government benefit, well, some of those people also paid into the systems that they are receiving something back from. So not only are you alienating people, but you're using misleading statistics. And so a lot of the concern people had over the IRS targeting scandal was overcome by this idiotic speech and comment that had been made at a fundraiser about 47% of people receiving a government benefit. So a lot of people thought that Mitt Romney was going to beat President Obama in the 2012 presidential election. And this 47% remark, historically speaking, is pointed to as one of the most famous examples of a candidate shooting themselves in their own foot during a campaign. During President Obama's second term, a very famous Supreme Court decision was reached. It was argued before the court in 2014. It was decided by the court in 2015, and that is Obergefell v. Hodges. Some states allowed, while others denied, marriage licenses to same-sex couples. This led to people needing to travel to completely different states in order to have a same-sex marriage recognized. And the Supreme Court decision declared that this was an unconstitutional violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, and that you cannot deny a marriage license to two consenting adults for any reason. And you might see more litigation on this matter because that did not include services provided, such as by a private business like a bakery or a florist. And so it allows a bakery or a florist to still deny service to a same-sex couple based on their own personal religious beliefs surrounding homosexuality and same-sex marriage. 
you may see, just like back when we learned about Brown versus Board of Education, and then a decade or so later, the Heart of Atlanta Motel versus U.S. decision that took things from a you must not segregate public buildings to also a you cannot segregate private businesses providing services to the public. So you may see a Heart of Atlanta Motel type decision still to come from the Supreme Court in the future. That's the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you in class.